today we are going to talk to Amisha who has been brought up by a mother who was profoundly deaf since childhood and we would see how children of parents who are deaf feel react and grow up i wish when did you first notice that your mother had hearing problem and how did you feel about it i think i knew my whole life because my mother was born deaf so there was lots of little things that happened um that i didn't know exactly what it was but i think there's one point where i realized that it was because she couldn't hear that she was different from other people i think one of the, that moment is when i was crossing a road and there was a blind spot so you can't see the cars coming and um i was always scared to cross those roads with her but i think one day i realized that it was because i could hear the cars coming and she couldn't so she would walk even if the car was coming that's when you realized that your mother had a hearing problem yeah that's when i realized it's because oh she can't hear i never realized why she would walk and i would hear the cars coming and she wouldn't then how did you really it adjust to your life with the hard problems i think you don't realize how everybody else's life is different until you start going to school and you start associating and see how other parents interact with their children because when you're a child it's just normal this is every this is the only thing that you know with your mother's problem what are the daily challenges you had and how did you really adjust to your living with her so they're different now than they were when i was a child so when i was a child it was things so basically that you been you were a child yeah you know it must have uh, changed over a period of time yeah a uh, bit your better understanding but when you were a child and slowly how did you adapt yeah. to the whole thing so there's certain things that she did knowing that with her hearing problem she wasn't able to give us the best education so one of the things was as a deaf person she knew that if she read stories to me at night because it's very important for a child's development to read books to them at night so that they can follow along and you do learn language that way right so she knew that if she had read books to me then her language was slightly distorted and was not normal and she didn't want me to pick up these um bad habits that she just had built up because she's not able to hear in the same way so she used to have a cd that would read out the story that linked to the book that i was reading so she had hundreds and hundreds of story books that she would have so we didn't have to listen to her read them in case she made a mistake yeah but wasn't it easy yeah and did you feel that the I mean, she just really overcome the challenge with her understanding of her own drama. Yeah, she had a very high awareness of like, I know that I have this problem, and I'm really worried that my child will have it, and I will do anything to make sure that they don't like miss out on anything because of my disability. And how did she, you know, really help you for your education or other things? You know, generally the parents would. Do. take part in the education or we take their homework or stuff like that yeah how did she manage that yeah i think it's different because she had a very increased level of paranoia about our development because also there can be some genetic associations with deafness so she was extremely paranoid when we were very young so she would take us to the doctor very regularly take us for hearing tests even when we were in school make sure that we were developing at the right rate but when you're that paranoid it can be very difficult for teachers to understand why that is and then also she had the communication difference with the teachers so they would not really she would not be able to express why she was feeling that way she would just come to school every day and try to talk to the teacher and she picked up on very little things so if we were struggling even slightly she would take us for tuition ask us why or try and figure out what she could do what she could buy or who she could ask for help so do you think it does too much of extraordinary effort on her part to bring you on up yeah it was a lot of effort and a lot of like emotional turmoil all the time the cow did her emotional turmoil affected you it yeah how did uh, your emotions uh, you know really got affected yeah because when somebody is putting so much energy and she would panic about little things so if i didn't brush my hair she would panic or if i didn't eat she would panic because it was like as a disabled person you don't want to feel like you're failing your children because everything is harder but the one thing that you don't want to do is fail your children so she put so much energy and attention and emotional effort into those things that it kind of takes away from the emotional effort that you can put into building a bond with the child so you sacrifice you essentially sacrifice that bond the child has to make it have a normal life and have the best chance at 
building a career and being successful in all of those other ways. So basically you want to say that it was it was not normal, but it was more very effectively controlled situation. And that control situation was because she want, she never wanted to see herself as being failed person and bringing up the children because of her disability. Would you yeah, say that? But I wouldn't say it was in a controlled situation. I think she was always hyper-focused on making sure that we succeeded or didn't turn out badly. So it was like there was panic at every stage if we slipped at any point when we were children. When we got a bit older and she realized that we had control over things, she kind of let go. Um, but when we were children, it was not so, it was control like a calm way. It was like a constant panic type of way, constant stress response type of way. Tell me, how did your friends uh, really adapted to your mother or did they really get along with your mother? Did they mix up with your mother? And what was their reaction? Yeah. I think when you're a child and before you realize a lot of things, you're very scared of how other children will react to your parents. So you kind of create separation and you don't mix them because you're scared of how people react and you just assume that they won't understand. But then as I got older, I was a lot more open to my friends coming and I would just explain to them, she can't hear, but she's amazing because she can lip read, which is more than most deaf people can do. Um, and my friends have been very, very supportive. They'll talk to her for longer than I'll sit and talk to her. <laughs> They'll come to my house just to speak to her. Um, and she loves to speak to them as well. But how did that happen? Kira, how did your friends get got along with her better than, I mean, not that you, but you could give. So, I mean, generally the friends, when they come, they talk to you. Yeah. More than they talk to your parents, right? Yeah. And then how did they, why did they talk more with her? Because it's about choosing friends that are friends with you for the right reasons and that are genuinely good people, right? So it's the same thing when I go to their house, I talk to their parents and they say whatever, whatever, whatever. But obviously in my situation is different because it's not the same two way conversation most of the time. And there's a little bit lack of understanding. But most people in my generation are very open and they understand and they want to learn from people like her who have a completely different perspective on life. So did you have to make any particular adjustment in the home? Uh to live with her, yeah, like any alarm systems or stuff like that. And how did you manage emergencies in the home? Yeah. So when I was a child, I didn't really implement a lot of these things. And there was a lot of things available that I didn't know about. But as I got older, I started to learn about these things that may not even be directed specifically for deaf people, but we found were useful. So things like the ring doorbell. So we have a camera on our door um, and whenever the somebody rings the bell, she'll get a notification on her phone and she can see who's at the door. So she's not just running to the door and opening the door for whoever, she can see and also she can speak. So if she sees there's a, a man trying to deliver a parcel, she can say, wait one minute. Whether she can understand what he says back is irrelevant because she can express what she needs to. And in that situation, it's helpful for her. Um, we used to have a doorbell that flicked with the light, um, but that's difficult as well, right? Because then the light will only go on and off downstairs. And what if she's upstairs? And what if she's not in the house? Um, and then before that, she had a text phone. Um, but I, that technology is being used a lot less now because we have smartphones and people are much more receptive to communicating over text message. Did you have to make any any particular changes in your career selection because of hard problems or you didn't have to? No, I didn't have to. I'd say both me and my brother wanted to stay as close to her as possible just so that she had a sense of security. And we live in London and a lot of the best universities are in London. So we just used it as motivation because we didn't see going out of London as an option. So did, did, uh, did you have to put in more effort to do that or sort of uh, feel that you, you were forced to make that effort to stay with her? No, I think it was the effort. We, we were lucky because both of the intentions and both of the outcomes that we wanted were aligned. So we also wanted to stay in London because there were better, better universities. But then also it was better for her because she could keep us 
in relative distance. Because it's also very difficult to maintain any sort of relationship with, in my experience, with um, people with hearing loss from a distance because communicating over the phone, you miss out so many aspects of communication. So just being in the same house, you can express that you care about somebody and you can express that you're looking after them well, a lot easier than you can over the phone and from a distance. Did you have to take any help from any of the groups or uh, organizations which are supporting the deaf people uh, for your purpose, like for your needs? Yeah. But I think when you... So the, but there's a deaf community that we are part of in London. And but it's more focused. Everything is more focused towards the individual, the, the person with hearing loss, because they're the one who's feeling the most isolation. But when you're supporting, you have a lot of feelings yourself of like, I think, insecure attachment, because it's where you learn that you can't trust your caregiver to do all of the things to keep you safe. And so I think a lot of people who grow up with parents who are deaf have that sense of insecure attachment, um, which I think is problematic for them later in, the lo in life, but is not really well supported. So what is the advice that you would give to the younger children uh, who have parents who are deaf? And what would you suggest the community should do about it? Yeah. Uh, when I say community, I would say community in general, even the school community. I think having the understanding of why they do certain things. If you're a child that and your mother is deaf, I think being open with your friends and making it normalized that supporting people and being proud of the fact that your parent has a disability and despite that they've overcome so much and how strong they are and how they have a different perspective on life. Just normalize it, just like not trying to hide it and because it makes society themselves not normalize it and awareness. Short would like to say that you know generally people who have a difference feel stigma about it. But you are saying you are trying to say that a child should get over the stigma of having a parent who are deaf. Yeah, really? Yeah. Is that what you mean? Yeah. And does it help? Yes. That that helps really. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else that you would like to improve the quality of life for children with the, uh, deaf parents? Yeah, I think you have to be aware that you are not going to have the same upbringing as other children will and you'll have to be more independent but that's not necessarily a bad thing like that's that can be a very good thing um, as long as you make it that way. Okay the last question is not about her about you now how did you help her to be more independent or if you couldn't help her? Could you help her? Yeah, I think when you have a parent with hearing loss, you helping them, you can see all of the ways that you can help them, but you have to get the balance between how much do I do things for them and how much do I create opportunities versus how much do I let them do life, how and grow by their own means, right? Because that's also important. Because every day we go into a different world with new opportunities. But when you have hearing loss, you spend so much of that time acclimatizing to that new world that you're basically a child all over again. Like she has to learn things from the beginning and it takes her that long to learn them. So one of the examples was when I, I wanted her to gain confidence because she had learned sign language, not because she needed to, but because she wanted to give back to the deaf community and be more integrated. So she doesn't really communicate with sign? No. She's oral. Yeah. And, but she had learned sign language because she wanted to be more integrated into the deaf community. So I knew that she had this skill. She could speak and she could do sign language. And I knew that in my university, they were looking for somebody to teach sign language. So I told one of the people running this program that she is a deaf person who can actually teach sign language because she can speak and she can sign at the same time. And I thought the students might benefit from having both of those experiences whilst also being able to learn from a deaf person. So um, I put her forward for this opportunity and initially she was very excited because it was a lot more money than what she was used to getting. And it was opportunities for deaf people to work don't come easily, especially when you're paying them to do something valuable. But See, this was very easy, putting it forward to her. But what you don't see is when you're supporting a deaf person, the turmoil that comes in doing new things. Like the days before, she was so angry and so frustrated and all of that came onto me, right? So why have you put me forward for this? I can't do this. 
why have you told everybody that I can do this? You're ruining my life. <laughs> um, but that's the thing you have to go through in order to push them to the next level. When she did it, when she came out, she was so excited. She was saying, oh, all of these children are more, I mean, all of these students are more scared of me than I am of them. <laughs> she gained confidence. She gained value. She realized how valuable she was as a disabled people in her perspective. Uh, but she wouldn't have done that. It wouldn't have been possible unless I had gone through that <laughs> emotional turmoil to support her. So everybody in your family has to do this or will they, uh, you do it? I think there's a baseline, right? Mm -hmm. So... To just to exist at the same house and help her do everyday things is difficult and draining. So to do things like this is usually a lot more, you're adding so much onto your stress that you already have. And then you also have things in your own life. When you're growing up, you have your own issues that you need to deal with. So our thing is like, we keep our baseline, we keep our support all the time. And then when things like this come up, we assess how much can I do this and how much can I do that. But then also you need to know when to let go. So sometimes if you don't have the capacity, you give them the opportunity, you let them have their breakdown and you let them grow by themselves. And sometimes that is the best thing to do, but you just need to evaluate that each time that it happens. So I think you really proud of your mother. Yes, very proud. Good. So thank you very much, Amisha. It was very useful and it's very enlightening for us as well as for the audience who will be seeing this. And we all thank you very much for your time. Today's conversation with Amisha was very enlightening for me and for you as well. And we understand that people with hearing loss do not support themselves, but also the people who are around them suffer as well. And if you're someone struggling to cope up with living with a person with a hearing loss, sign up below and get a free consultation.